Um, I thank all of you for our gala. It was an outstanding session for us. Um, our president um, will offer greetings and offer welcome. But before we do any of that, we have the, the phenomenal, well-known, best speaker I've ever heard, Reverend DeGraff in the house. We'd like to have him come and give us prayer. The food has already been blessed. <laughs> if we're gonna talk about domestic violence, that's an intimate crime. It's an intimate injustice. And so we need to have an intimate setting so that we can connect with one another. So before we go to the throne of grace, if, if you would turn to somebody who's not sitting next to you and just look them in the eye in a New York kind of way and say, I'm so glad you're here. It was my privilege to represent the 100 black men and the United States at a panel on violence against women at the United Nations during Women's History Month. And we took the position that the ancestors of slaves ought to be able to appreciate what violence is all about and that men need to talk up about this. It's not all right for you to go upside your woman's head. It's not all right for you to have a fit and act like your female is your property. And so this, uh, this evening is so timely and it's appropriate that before we go any further, that we go to the throne of grace in prayer. Our Father and our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come before your throne as humbly as we know how. We come on this evening seeking greater understanding and harmony and vision about the precepts that your son died for. We come too to harmonize with one another, get to know one another better and leave here better than we came. We ask that you extend a special blessing to those who would be on the panel and that you would open all of our hearts and minds to new ideas, new concepts, and to the peace that surpasses understanding. These blessings we ask not in our name, but in the name of the one who conquered death and hell in the grave. And the family that loves God said, Amen. the family that loves God said, Amen. God bless you tonight. Next, I'd like to bring to the stage our esteemed president, um, Aldrin Ennis, uh, to give us welcome, to give us greetings, and to uh, introduce our hosts and our panelists. So, Mr. President, please. How's everyone doing tonight? Good, good. Um, we are going to have an amazing conversation. Uh, I was just with the with the women uh, last night over Zoom um, to kind of gauge uh, how the, the flow of the conversation is going to work. And I thought I knew one thing about domestic violence and I got a whole education in the span of about 45 minutes. So I know that this conversation is going to um, raise awareness in the community, which is very much needed. And um, I think we have a phenomenal group of women I don't want to belabor this, but um, just to say thank you for attending. Um, there is one thing about black men standing shoulder to shoulder with black women um, on a topic that is prevalent. <laughs> but we are in a, a, an amazing space, right? And um, the gentleman um, who helped us get the space um, is none other than Dr. Basil Smichael Jr. So I will ask Basil to, to come to the podium and extend some greetings. Basil. Doctor. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome again. I, uh, thank you, Brother President, for the introduction. I'm Basil Smichael. I'm a professor here at Hunter College, but I also uh, run the public policy program in this building, my office is right upstairs. This building is the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, so I run the public policy program. And I have a colleague, Jessica Newworth, who runs the human rights program also in this building. So a note about this building, this was actually the home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And in fact, 
um, is also the home of Sarah, his mother. If you notice that this is actually two mansions, uh, when uh, the couple got married, Sarah gifted the mansion to the new couple. We should all be so lucky. Uh, but there's, there was actually a partition in between the two, so Sarah could look up on the new couple um, every day. She and Eleanor did not get along. Um, but it is. But this was their home. In fact, this area was both a kitchen and dining area uh, where Eleanor Roosevelt hosted married McLeod Bethune. Um, on the two floors above us is the library where um, Roosevelt, uh, when the at the time when um, the inaugural was in March, um, hosted when he, he remember he had been governor of New York before president, um, he sketched out the New Deal in the library that's two floors above us, and the architecture of the, of Social Security with Francis Perkins, who became his labor secretary, the first woman to be a cabinet secretary in history. On that same floor um, is the fireplace in the room where he had his first fireside chat. So it's a remarkable space. Um, we encourage you to uh, come to a, a lot of the events that we have here. In fact, a week from today um, at five o'clock, I'll be in conversation with uh, the former White House political director under Obama, who was the former ambassador to South Africa and is now the CEO of the Center for American Progress, uh, Patrick Gaspar. So we'll be right here in conversation to talk about uh, public policy in America today. Um, so we have some great programming, some great conversations in the building. I hope uh, to see you back here. And you know, to my brothers at 100 Black Men, yes, I was inducted into this fabulous institution in 2001. It's been a while since I paid my dues though. And I told the president today, uh, if, if I could do it through an app, I promise I will do it. Uh, you got it. All right. I, got, I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say it from the microphone if I wasn't right. Um, but I am. As long as it's well, never mind. Um, but but I'm I'm glad to see you here. Welcome and look forward to a tremendous conversation. Thank you very much. So um, with it being Women's History Month, um, one of the things that I decided to do during my presidency is to honor women um, during this special month. Obviously, women should be honored every day. Um, but as society dictates, you get a month. Uh, <laughs> but um, but what, what, what I want to do is bring up uh, the moderator. And what she will do is she will introduce the, the panel. Um, we won't go too much into their bios. Um, they'll touch upon it as they speak um, this evening. But our moderator um, is Vanessa Ponceville. Vanessa. And she will control this conversation. Uh, <laughs> She, she has that privilege um, for, for the evening. I know that she will do a phenomenal job just because of the person that she is. And um, Vanessa, the stage is yours. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's evening now, so I'm going to say good evening. Um, I'm actually going to stand tonight. I'm instead of sitting, because um, I think I want the stage to be just for the panelists. and. I can actually see them and talk because I want to also engage with you all um, as well in this important um, conversation. So I'm really honored to be here. And this is a topic that is really close and dear to my heart. Um, so before I go into my sub story, <laughs> I'm going to bring the panelists in onto the stage today. So we are joined today by Courtney Chase, who is the Deputy Di Director of Victim Services at the Office of Richmond County District Attorney. Let's all welcome Courtney. You can see that. Let me move. Um, our next panelist is Wozman Pierre Louis, um, she's the executive director of the NYU McSilver Institute of Poverty and Policy Research. Let's all welcome Wilson. 
And last but not least, our wonderful founder and CEO of all of We All Really Matter, um, Stephanie McGraw. So before we actually get started, I have a question for you all. When you think of, when you hear the words domestic violence, what comes to your mind? I actually want you to shout them out to us. Suffering. Sadness. Sadness. Physical. Physical. Mental illness. Mental illness. Inequality. Control. Control. Power. 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 Trauma. Trauma, yes. Injury. Injury. Yes, fighting children. Crime. Crime. Family separation, yes. Bitterness, yes. Anything else? That one too? Community destabilization. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for participating in this because I want you all to think about all these words as we are talking um, this evening. Um, so the domestic violence is also known as intimate partner violence. We know that it does not discriminate against race, gender, socioeconomic status. Even if you live in a mansion, you can be impacted by domestic violence. We all know this. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job, um, not only as an ally, as an advocate against violence and sexual violence, to not say that we know that domestic violence also impacts men. We know that, um, although we are focusing on a special population this evening, so I want to make sure that I let you know that we are aware that domestic violence impacts everyone, including children, including men can also be victims of domestic violence. So before we get started with the panels, I'm actually going to tell you a couple of statistics because I think it's important. Um, one in, according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, one in four women and one in nine men experience severe intimate partner physical violence, um, intimate partner contact like sexual assault, intimate partner stalking, which impacts such as injury, fearless, fearfulness, and post-traumatic stress disorder. One in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. This include behaviors like um, slapping someone, shoving them, pushing them, in some cases, we don't, they don't even consider them as domestic violence, those victims. They don't see themselves as victims of domestic violence. Um, one in seven women and one in 25 men have been injured by an intimate partner. Um, and also one in 10 women have been raped by an intimate partner. And also the data for male survivors of sexual assault is also unavailable. And we know why. There's a lot of shame that comes with reporting your sexual assault as a man. I'm not a man, but I've worked with male survivors. I know there's a lot of shame and guilt that comes with that. So the data is very, it's not available to us, but I know there's a lot of survivors out there. Um, we know that intimate partner violence impacts us, all, impacts us all. So again, we are focusing on how it impacts women this evening, but we want to also extend um, our heart to men who have experienced this and that we all deserve justice and care and nurture that we need. And as an advocate, we all are here to assist. So if you know someone who may be silenced and they need support, we are here afterwards to talk to you all. So let's all jump in into this conversation. So this question is actually for Courtney. So domestic violence is also known as intimate partner violence. We know that it's a pattern of behavior that uses control and power against um, the victim. It can take many forms of like um, physical, sexual, emotional, financial, psychological, and even stalking through your phones as well, right? So how do you approach working with victims who may be reluctant to come forward? And, might, and sometimes they may not even realize that they're being victimized. So with everything that I do, I try my best to lead with empathy and compassion to start. Um, and through my training, through uh, many years of doing this work, remaining client-centered and trauma-informed, which basically means meeting the person where they're at. It's not about me, it's not about my wishes, it's about their lived experiences. There could be various reasons as to why they are in this relationship. Um, so it's really providing them with information and resources, letting them know what it is like if they went through the criminal justice process or if they sought out um, 
assistance through community-based organizations, so giving them the choice because, again, being in a domestic violence relationship, that power has been stripped to, from them for so long that um, it has to be up to them, right? And um, they know what's best for them. So doing that and really providing psychoeducation about what domestic violence is. So um, unfortunately, a lot of times when I'm meeting with survivors, this has become their norm for so long. So it's talking about power and control, what that looks like. It's talking about what love is and what love is not. And just reminding them that, you know, I'm not here to judge you. Ultimately, it's your decision when you are ready or excuse me, or even if you decide to stay, there's still services, there's still people here to support you. So that's, that's what I do. Thank you. Um, so this next question is for um, um, Rosemont Pierre-Louis. So you have, a dis uh, you spend a dis distinctive amount of time in your career leading the charge against domestic violence. Um, you now lead a team of scholars, clinicians, and policy experts of the Mick Silver Institute. Um, thank you for your work. <laughs> um, how does poverty and socioeconomic class um, actually contribute to domestic violence? And what can be done actually to, so there's two questions. <laughs> it's sure. two questions. Um, so how does poverty and also socio socioeconomic class can actually contribute to domestic violence? And the second question is, and what can we be done to address these underlying issues? So I would say a couple of things, and thank you so much for the question. I'm thrilled to be here uh, with my colleagues uh, who are in the forefront of the anti-violence movement, and of course to 100 Black men. Um, a couple of things that I want to say to preface um, my response is, first and foremost, you hear oftentimes when you talk to people, they say, domestic violence only happens to those people. And there's a perception that domestic violence happens in black and brown neighborhoods, but doesn't happen on the Upper East Side. So I want to preface it by saying that domestic violence happens everywhere, every community across race, class, and creed. And I remember when I was practicing and representing um, survivors of domestic violence in courts throughout New York City, I remember uh, someone said, domestic violence doesn't happen on the east side. And you may have remembered this case when um, the perpetrator used a dumbbell to bludgeon his uh, intimate partner. And this was really the first time that it raised awareness that this is not just in Northern Manhattan where I live or Central Brooklyn or other parts of the city that may be economically depressed. What I will say, though, is that if you are working poor, immigrant, uh, living at the margins, leaving an abusive relationship can be extremely difficult because you don't have the ability to just move and find a new apartment, right? You have considerations with your children in terms of the court system and navigating that because you can't just take your ch children and up and move. There are many things that hold survivors who are low income back. And so one of the most famous things I hear from people is why didn't they leave? And your, your status in terms of income, access to resources, access to a social network is critically important. And I would also say this, that we've all seen this and we talked about this yesterday, is that when you have someone who is married to a person of means, who's been abusive and that relationship ends, their circumstances can be just as problematic as a woman who is low income, right? because the money is cut off, access to the house, credit cards, and all the other resources, and the social support network. And what I would say to your question about what can we do, we need to understand that there are some disparate impacts for um, low income women, immigrant women, um, and that we have to continue to make investments at the city, state, and federal level 
to ensure that any person, when they decide to leave an abusive relationship, that they have the resources, the support, the organizations, whether it be the DA's office, Family Justice Center, or an organization like WARM to be able to leave that relationship safely and to have the support that they need. Thank you. So it's this conversation came up last night as we were um, talking about um, why they don't leave. And I found this, um, this statistic from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, it is says that um, victims of intimate partner violence lose a total of 8 million um, days of paid work each year. And the cost of intimate partner violence exceeds to $8.3 billion per year. And between 21 to 60 percent of victims of intimate partner violence loses their jobs um, due to reasoning stemming from that abuse. Um, and also between 2003 and 2002, 142 women were murdered in their workplace. Um, so if this is an, an issue that's just not impacting the home. It's also impacting everyone, right? The, um, the workplace, your coworkers who are also um, seeing these things, like these 143 women um, killed in their workplace. So um, the next question is actually for Stephanie, um, who um, has done a lot of great work in her community um, to not only help survivors, but also prevent abuse in her community. She's a survivor of domestic violence and has made it her life mission to empower and assist other women. Um, my question is, how can communities and um, individuals better support um, victims of domestic violence? Thank you so much for asking that question. Um, we can simply do by what we're doing here. Um, I'd like to thank the 100 Black Men for putting this together. I have been doing this work for 12 years now and I have never been to a domestic violence panel discussion, a domestic event when they were more men and women. Me and Brenda has been out there in the front lines for years and we've never seen this, right, Brenda? So this is all God. So we wanna thank because we cannot do this work. We cannot begin to eradicate domestic violence if we are not bringing the men into the equation. You know, my father left when I was 10 years old, so I didn't see men, right? And, and we know that, you know, 95% of women that come into our, our agency are women, right? And we know that a large proportion of the batterers are men. But one of the things that we're finding is that there's not a lot of help out there for men. So we're starting to uh, bring men into the equation because we all really matter. It's not just about women that matter. It's about uh, men and women and children and uh, the, L the LGBTQ community. It is under that umbrella of violence. Violence does not discriminate against anyone. Any one of us could be affected. And I'm just so honored that you men are here because I'm pretty sure, how many men in audience have daughters? Okay, it is important because you have an opportunity to recognize it and see if your daughter comes home and um, she doesn't have her phone and, and she comes home and said her, uh, she was went out on a date and her date told her to change her hair or she shouldn't wear this or don't call that person. Those are early signs of domestic violence. And it is the, it is the job of the men to educate their daughters and their children in the community. I have right here, this is a book. You mentioned that it was, uh, hundred and something women that were murdered. Okay, this book right I have right here, this is Sanaya Lawrence. She was murdered, we did her candlelight visual. She was 16 years old, murdered in Harlem on 135th and 7th Avenue. Three generations of domestic violence and absent father. So this is how we can begin to shift anything in our community because we can't do it alone. We need our men. And, and most of the times when we're out there, we're out there on the front line without our men. So it starts here. And this is what 100 Black men are doing. So I am so honored to be here. I want to thank you because we need to continue this, not just down here in Harlem and Brooklyn and South Jamaica and on the boondocks and the Bronx, all over the United States, because it's not just a, a, a this is a, a human right issues. It's not just a domestic violence issue. It is a human right issue and domestic violence is killing our communities. 
Thank you. Um, I love to see, see and hear the passion in your voice when you speak. <laughs> Before we move on, actually, this is another question for the audience. What are some common myths and, mis and beliefs that even you have held about domestic violence? You can, you can shut them out to me. I'll start. Why didn't you leave? I hear that all the time. Anything else? He loves me. He loves me. Yes. He'll change. He'll change. I'm change. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Stop telling my story. <laughs> <laughs> Any other myths and beliefs? Yes. I heard a lot of young women when I was younger say that if you don't put your hands on me, you don't love me. Mm. So it becomes normalized in a way. Mm, yeah, it will never happen to me. It was only one time. He's learned his lesson now. He won't do it again. Mm. He was just angry. Yeah. I made him angry. <laughs> what did you do? Right. Um. So this that and we some of us, some of these things we've said ourselves, right? Before we got the knowledge that we have, like it, 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 it shouldn't. It's not this bad if you're still there. I've heard a lot of that as well. Have you tried couples counseling? I'm a, I'm a counselor um, and I do couples work. The moment that I hear violence in the womb, I'm like, okay, everybody stop, everybody stop. Um, we're, no, we're not gonna continue couples counseling. This is what, we're not gonna do this. We do individual work. We're gonna do, do, do battle as intervention. And then we can come together. We're not doing this, let's, let's stop it. A lot of counselors do not do couples counseling. There's active violence in the home. Um, so the next question is actually for Courtney. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions um, surrounding domestic violence and how do they affect the way that victims are treated by society? And when I say society, it's not just us, but even in the um, criminal justice system, right? Um, when survivors are trying to get um, access to services as well. I think one of the biggest ones is um, like leaving equal safety. And it it doesn't. Um, it can, but in many many instances, it does not. Um, usually, the violence actually increases. Um, people also feel, or another misconception is, you know, just get an order of protection, right? But that order of protection, we're entrusting. That's exactly. It's just a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and we're entrusting someone that has caused so much harm to abide by it. You know, no. And then um, also. Speaking of the criminal justice system, um, that doesn't equal safety for everyone, right? Depending on how they identify, um, depending on what community community they come from, that might be instilling more fear, right? What if the person causing harm is a police officer? Mm -hmm. Then where do they go, right? So there, there's many layers to this, and um, I think we've said a lot today about why people don't leave, right? And like, it's an easy decision, but it's not. There's so many barriers that are preventing um, survivors from leaving. And I like what was said earlier that this can happen anywhere and it does happen anywhere. I am, although I'm a deputy director, I'm all, I also have a small caseload and I only work with high risk intimate partner violence survivors. And when I say it can happen to anyone, it can. You know, it shouldn't be an us versus them. We all need to come together and work together to, like you said earlier, eradicate this issue because it's a public health issue, right? It it affects people on so many levels. Like we said earlier, families, children, um, even families outside of the home, right? Like you see your family member getting harmed, but that person has to be ready to leave you can't force someone to leave, right? But if they're not ready, if they don't have the resources that they need, if those barriers aren't going, aren't removed, it pushes them back to the person that's been causing them so much harm. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a conversation when I, I worked with domestic violence survivors and a lot of time, it, it's a very delicate situation when someone said, well, I'm ready to leave. And as an advocate, you have to, sit there and talk about all of the safety planning stuff and safety planning can take months for some people depending on how bad the issue is um 
I believe I think the, the, the number is 72% of women were murdered or murdered after they left. Um, so it's not that easy to just, okay, we'll just leave. You left, you're safe. Um, so yeah, over, I think 94% of the victims of these murders were female as well, but 72% um, of the murder suicides involved an intimate partner and it was after these people so left the relationship. Additionally, the rates of homicides rise mm -hmm. when um, survivors are trying to leave and stalking. Yes. Those are the two that I see a lot when survivors are trying to leave. Yeah. Because it is the most dangerous time, and that's why we do the work that we do, the critical work that we do in Harlem and Brooklyn and Bronx, and uh, we're not yet in Staten Island, but we're coming. <laughs> right, but it is the most dangerous time, and because a lot of women don't know that, and I'm talking about myself, because I, you know, we base our organization on lived experiences, mm -hmm. and the most dangerous time of the woman is trying to leave because it's all about power and control. Right. And when a woman is trying to remove herself from that to control um, these kind of men, because it, it's mental illness and a whole lot of other stuff, but it is uh, the most dangerous time. And that's why we do the work that we do in educating our community about that issue. Thank you. Um, the next question is for um, Wozman. Um, in what ways can um, our government agencies and policymakers take action to guarantee that domestic violence victims, especially those in the marginalized communities, such as people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, and also immigrant populations, can access the necessary resources and support um, that they need? Sure. Um, I just want to piggyback on, on what was just said. I think one of the things to keep in mind is the power of living in a home where domestic violence has occurred. And there are statistics that show that there's a higher percentage of you either being an abuser or someone who is abused, if that's what you learn is the love language in, in the home. And I would say another, a myth that's out there, particularly for women when they stay in relationships, well, she must like being hit. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody wants to be hit, beat up, punched, choked, stabbed, or and certainly uh, the worst of it, uh, being killed. So that's important to keep in mind. I would say here in New York City in particular, we are um, extremely lucky because the city of New York has made tremendous investments in the area of domestic violence. We have family justice centers that provide wraparound services for victims of domestic violence in all five boroughs. Um, during my time as commissioner, I got to see the, the, the uh, opening and be part of the process um, for Staten Island. These organizations, these family justice centers contract with community based organizations like warm to come to the center and provide services, whether it's social work, housing, immigration, children's services, of course, attorneys uh, to assist because we all know that when a survivor decides to leave or is in need of support, the safety net has to come into play. And uh, we have made those investments. I think where there's a real opportunity is developing more resources like warm in communities and in neighborhoods, right? Think about a survivor who decides they're going to leave and they live at a very far distance. I'm going to use Manhattan, right? Let's say they live in Washington Heights and they want to go get services down uh, at the Family Justice Center in Manhattan, which is a tremendous resource and does incredible work, it would be really helpful to have that in Washington Heights or in Harlem so that survivors don't have to think about what, do I'm, what am I going to say to be able to leave the house for that long to be able to go there, come back, do my interview, uh and be able to tell my story so thinking about neighborhood-based resources like warm which i'm so proud of stephanie and the work that she's done and particularly in a neighborhood like harlem that has some of the highest statistics um along with the bronx in terms of intimate partner violence um but we need those kinds of resources we also need 
grassroots, community-based, culturally relevant, because when you lay culture, religion, all of those things play as factors in terms of whether or not you decide to stay in a relationship. Immigration being one of the most um, uh, serious examples of intimate pa partner violence, because it doesn't involve punching or hitting, it can involve that someone who you've married and has said that they will file their papers with the immigration court. And the next thing you know, after you get m married, your passport disappears, the application never gets filed, and it is used as a tool of control. That if you leave, or if you call the police, or if you try to uh, go to the courts, I will not file your papers, or if they're undocumented, they will call and say, they'll say something, words to the effect of, I will call the police and let you know um, that you are undocumented. So you know, in New York City, the NYPD does not ask questions about immigration status. But this is the kind of information that we need to be doing in community, in the streets, and it could be something that we could I'm just throwing it out there for a hundred black men to to be in in the neighborhood to talk to people on the street and have real conversations about intimate partner violence to go into schools to talk about young people because what we all know from our experience is that our clients are getting younger yes. and when i mean young i'm talking about middle school and high school, and certainly we know um, in college, there's also experiences with dating violence. We need to talk to our community about this issue, and certainly in black and brown communities, oftentimes it is a conversation that happens um, more often than not too late. And so community-based resources, uh, culturally relevant resources, resources that are tailored to the LGBTQ plus community that caters to survivors of trafficking, which we haven't talked about trafficking because that's another <laughs> that's another thing that's really happening. It's not just, you know, in Eastern Europe, it is happening on 125th Street. It is happening in Central Brooklyn. It is happening um, in, in clubs and other types of establishments. So these are the kinds of what I would say, not only courageous conversations, but the real talk that needs to happen at our kitchen tables with our friends and certainly with other men. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Stephanie. Okay. Um, thank you for bringing up um, the resources for LGBTQ plus communities, um, Usman. Um, that question is actually about what are some unique challenges that may be um, in your work that you've seen LGBTQ um, population may face when it comes to receiving services for domestic violence? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Uh, you know, the organization WARM stands for We All Really Matter. So that's everyone under that umbrella. And we have been seeing, especially during the pandemic, we saw a lot of uh, L LGBTQ plus men and women coming in for help. You know, it's already a stigma. Domestic violence is already like, you know, in our communities, still to this day, women and, and uh, even men and children look at it as being a shame. And we are here to expose for what really is. It's a crime and it's nothing to be ashamed of. The only shame is not telling your story. Tell your story. This is her history, Mark. So let your story be told. And one of the things that we have been seeing with this pandemic is that in that community, there's so much stigma and shame. Already you, you know, um, you're dealing with your your own sexuality, and then you have a community that is also looking at you like shame and, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of violence against in this community. And then when you have uh, a partnership with same sex, uh, or even with men and women, we, we've heard some stories from same sex with women and how violent um, the other counterpart 
is, you know, dealing with emotions and dealing with the cycle and dealing with attitude and behaviors, all of that pay a factor. But what we have seen is that we have found a space for them where they can come and feel wanted and know that they can tell their story and get some help and they won't be um, shamed on and talked about and saying, oh, you're different, go somewhere else. No, we, the, we are all God's children. And it, and it doesn't make a difference what your sexuality is, because again, domestic violence is a crime. Mm -hmm. So we have made a space for that community. We're doing a big event in June. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We actually want to shift our attention to the other bystanders, not just bystanders, but also who just happen to be collateral damage and domestic violence children. So um, the next question is actually for Courtney. Um, we know that everyone loses, especially the children who are just innocent kids who didn't ask to be here. Um, when violence happened, um, can we talk a little bit about the impact that intimate partner violence have on children? And um, how can we support um, survivors um, who have witnessed domestic violence in the home? Yeah, so I feel like this is a, all of this has been heavy, but especially the children, right? Because they don't really have a voice in being in the home and experiencing um, the trauma that they're witnessing, right? And, you know, I think as adults, we often say, oh, they don't really understand, or children are resilient, or what have you. But what we're not talking about, again, is that trauma and the fact that, depending on the child, they might not be able to articulate what it is that they're witnessing or what they're feeling, right? So then they act out in other ways, and then they're labeled as like a problem child, right? They go to school, maybe they're not performing in the way that they should be performing, right? Um, but no one's asking the real questions, right? What's going on at home? Did you eat last night, right? Did you witness something in your home? Like, do you have a trusted adult that you could speak to, right? So it's all about education and prevention, right? So when we're in the home, there is this stigma, but we can't shy away from it, right? Because if we don't catch it at this age, there's a high likelihood that it'll continue into adulthood, right? Because again, if they're not being shown what love is, if they're not showing what healthy communication is, right? Um, it's okay to have an argument, like you're human, right? We're not always going to get along, but are you fighting fairly? Like, you know, like we have to, as adults, as parents, as caregivers, we are the examples for our children for the future, right? As corny as that might sound, but it's the truth. Um, and honestly, if we, continue this, again, those children are labeled. So it's really important to, if we're noticing things, what interventions are available for these children, right? Is it counseling? Is it um, individual or group, what have you, depending on the children's age? We mentioned the Family Justice Center. They do um, have counseling for children, I believe as young as three, right? Because there's ways that children can communicate. Um, something that we found in our office um, you were mentioning trafficking earlier, but sometimes there's substance use in the home as well, right? And so what we're noticing is children who are in homes where there's intimate partner violence, but also substance use disorder, right? So what we've done is we try to identify those families and for the caregiver who isn't the harming party, we reach out to them and try to get the child involved in trauma focused uh, therapy at a young age so that they have the opportunity. It's not real. It, they, again, they don't have to necessarily like verbalize what it is that they're witnessing, but there are ways that you can communicate with children, even if they don't have the language. You mentioned um, reaching out to the um, parent who's not causing the harm. So what if that parent um, was not causing the harm? refuses care for the children? What's the next step for that child? I think that, you know, we can keep trying, right? Like, I, I can't force anyone to do anything, right? Because sometimes, again, even if they're not causing harm, they, um, they might not be well, willing to take that next step. They're not going to trust me. I recognize the, the office that I work for. But I think that's why it's really important 
for the community to be involved, for that child to have outside support, right? I think that sometimes we know what's happening in our friends or in our family's homes, right? But we shy away from that conversation. So that child needs a trusted adult. Um, even if you are a teacher, say this all the time, I have a son, but my teacher, I feel, his teacher, I feel like spends more time with him than I do, right? So I think you can notice when there's a change um, in the child. And I think it's important that we don't shy away from these conversations. I think sometimes that fear takes over, mm -hmm. but we as adults, it's okay for us to be scared, right? But we have to move through that because that child doesn't have a choice. If I could just jump in uh, on on this as well, and um, to the point about the parent who may not be the perpetrator of the violence, also keep in mind when you're dealing with domestic violence cases, you're dealing with multiple systems. And one of the biggest concerns is child welfare. Yes. Because we know in black and brown communities is overly represented in the child welfare system. And for a family that is dealing with violence, food insecurity, uh, and uh, trauma, to engage another system can propel the family into further harm. Obviously, there are standards for social workers, as we all know, um, that when mandated reporting has to be done, but there are some sensitivities, and I love what you just said, about continuing to work with that parent for them to understand not only the harm that is being done, but also the need of an innocent child that did not ask to be exposed to violence. And we know how when you carry that trauma through your entire life, we haven't even talked about how that kind of trauma can lead to be a feeder to the you know, the, the, the poverty to prison pipeline, to the criminal justice system. So it's really important that um, we understand the nuances of the safety net and how that can impact a family. And that's why conversation, uh, safety planning, and really having the patience. I, I think you have to have a lot of patience to do this work. And it's, you know, a lot of people ask if it's depressing. It's not depressing because when you help someone who's decided to leave a relationship to successfully leave and the entire system comes together, it is an extraordinary feeling um, to, to, to see that, so. Yeah, I'd like to uh, just jump in on that piece as well. Uh, today, we, we're the critical response team. Um, and what that is, is we go out um, in the middle of the night on a Sunday, I got out my bed on a Sunday because a commanding officer from Brooklyn, I'm sorry, from the Bronx, Anthony Mossy, I say his name all the time, called me on a Sunday because he had a mother with six children. He called all those other agencies uh, that are very well known out there and none of the agencies was available to help this family. And because I work very closely with NYPD and we're the only um, civilian agency that, that's in Domstack every month, and Domstack is when you, all the priests come together to discuss the domestic violence and, and the critical issues and all the cases, um, I got out my bed on a Sunday. But what I want to say to, and it is so rewarding, we do it every single day, we're rescuing women, getting them out. And, but what I want to say to that question you asked, I want to speak to that little child. Because I was that little child at 10 years old when my father left, and all I saw was violence in my home. I just thought that it was supposed to be like that. My father beat my mother on a regular. I went to my friend's house. Their father was beating their wives. I went to my aunt's house. Her husband was beating her. So this is something that we saw. We saw black exploitation movies, so we didn't see any greatness in our community. We thought it was supposed to be like that. So as a child at 10 years old, I charged. We had a big meeting with the Board of Education. We don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to go somewhere. But I like to see us getting into the school in second grade and third grade and approaching because if somebody would have said to me, little black child, what your daddy is doing to your mama 
It's called domestic violence. But nobody said that to me in second grade and third grade and fourth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade and so on until, you know, I got to one of the grades and I was like, bye, I can't do it no more. Right? But because of the trauma, because of because of the lack of information. So speaking to that little girl that did not get the information, and I'm here today to say the importance of it's called, you can't fix what you can't see, right? So you have to be able to know what's happening and then and then get to help for it, right? So we need to we need to really be into the schools. I mean, we, there need to be programs in the second grade, age appropriate. If this happened, if you see that, there's a name for it, right? And I think we can start to save lives because I do this work because I don't want another young girl or, or older woman or a younger woman to have to experience what I experienced, uh, you know, trauma for over a 30 years, a span until God just said, come on, it's time to go. So those little children, these are the lenses. And these lenses are developing because they're taking pictures. And when it comes out into that dark room and it comes out and then it comes out and it's developed, it's developing what it see. And it goes right into the violence and it just continue to perpetuate. And everything under the umbrella, all the shooters, all this violence, all this gang violence, all, they're coming out of violent homes. Because my mother, that's what came out of my mother. My mother had nine children, and the majority of her children went out to the street in very violent uh, situations. And also ACS, we called the commissioner up to Harlem, and we brought the commissioner of ACS. We told him, no, you come from 150 up there, Broadway. You come up here to Harlem because we want you to see what your casework is going to. Because when a black woman hear ACS, she hears my child gonna be talking away from me. But when a white woman hear ACS, she hears resources and help. So the commissioner came up and we took him to the belly of the beast, which is the polo grounds, one of them amongst many. And we walked in them project. We said, look at what our people have to deal with the drugs, the alcohol, the poverty, the lack, the resources that are not there. So we have a conversation about how he can, because change don't happen up there, it happens here. You gotta walk through it and see what your, your workers are doing to make effective change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we have a question. Yes. Okay, that was, I think that was part of what, our next question. Wait, 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 wait. No, we ain't got to talk about it. You can see it right here. This is what it looks like when yes. we eradicate it, when we say it stopped the violence, when we say enough is enough. I went through domestic violence for a very long period of time. This is what it looks like, because healing is sexy, right, Brother Al? When you start to hear, okay, can I get a witness? Okay. <laughs> No, no, this is, thank you for asking that question, because this is the other side of all that darkness and all that pain. Like God took my pain and suffering and made something great out of it. Not only for me, but for women that just cannot see that it's a possibility. Every, every woman that comes into warm, I get to heal alongside with her because I get to tell my story of how I got, get out, got out. And that's how we help women just telling our story. So this is how the other side looks. And we talk about it every day and we share where we come from because that's another problem too. Sometimes we be like, oh, I ain't telling nobody what happened to me. They ain't gonna be telling, look, look hard. No, I dropped out of school and at 50, I, get my, I got my GED, okay? And at 55, I graduated from college. This is, we have to tell our stories. This is the other side of what greatness look like because we are, all God's children and everything is in a universe waiting for us. But we just gotta say, I'm ready. And we all really matter is there for those women when they come. Sometimes we just go and get them. 
We just got to go snatch him up. Do you want to live or do you want to die? Because it's real serious like that. Women are dying. I show you my book. All these women murdered. Over 40 women murdered in Harlem, in Bronx, in Brooklyn. We were just in Brooklyn the other day. Two women murdered in Brooklyn. The 67 precinct and the 60, 79 precinct murdered. So the other side looks like this. It looks like women telling their story. It looks like beautiful colors of, of black and brown and white and green and yellow. And it looks like a hundred black men in the audience strong supporting us as women. Thank you. I would just also add to that really great question is that um, it would mean that if we had success in this area and we were able to eradicate that we have fully embraced at all levels of society that violence of any kind is unacceptable. That would mean that the resources that need to be placed equitably, not equally, but equitably in communities, particularly those who are under resourced underserved, but also experience the biggest brunt of, of violence of all forms, have the proper investments to ensure that those who want to leave a relationship can do so on their timetable with the support, that they can access shelter, that they can access a lawyer, that they can get the resources that they need in order to move. And it also means dismantling the perceptions there are of women that are held about women, right? In terms of, uh, you know, you can go to the early origins of women not being seen as individuals and equal partners, but as chattel. So it would mean that at all levels of society, there would be the systemic and societal change that supports women, that invests women, that invests in communities, that are underserved, that invest in immigrant communities so that we are leveling the playing field, but also providing women the support that they need so that when they wanna leave, they have the support from what men, women, aunts, uncle, neighbor, law enforcement, city government, state government, federal government, and that where there's a gap in it, getting those resources so that we can get to the other side, that there is the commitment and the resources applied to do so. Um, I really appreciate that you mentioned equity. Um, so I'm in school and a lot of my research I'm doing is surrounding equity when it comes to black women and when they're seeking out services and um, especially for domestic violence and to see the like disconnect from service providers from law enforcement for i'm going to speak about black women because that's what my research is on but like that perception that they have to be the strong black woman that they have to be the perfect victim and talk a certain way act a certain way we need to let all of that go all of that needs to be let go because when someone is being harmed suffering none of that should matter if i am going through a domestic violence situation and i call 911 i should be received the same way my neighbor will be received in a different community right and i think we have to continue again these conversations i know we're talking about conversations but we have to hear from the victims and survivors that endure this every single day because i think that's when the real change starts and that's when we can measure success because we hear from them what success looks like. Because for us, we have an idea as being service providers, right? But I think it's really important to hear from that survivor that I'm that I'm working with what their success is. So is it leaving their relationship, right? Is it being able to go back to school, right? Is it breaking that generational trauma, right? Is it just being able to feel safe and I don't have to walk in eggshells, right? I think those there's there's levels of ways that we can measure success, but for me, the most important thing is really listening to that survivor that I'm working with and seeing them grow, and then they feel like they're in a better place. Thank you. Yes. 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 Yes.
perpetrator first right to be there alone. So I think ensuring that the victim that they're not alone, that is good for them to be responsible for the information that as well. To separate from the perpetrator and get the services that they need to flourish and not become a victim. Yeah. So the, the, the importance of community, and that's the reason why a lot of perpetrators tend to remove their victims from their community, because if you have a community, you're less likely to experience those things, so the community can say, oh, wait, what's happening here, and rally around this person, that's also a tactic of um, DV, or domestic violence, or intimate partner violence, is to remove that survivor or potential victim from their community and isolate them, potentially. Um, I guess we're getting into a question. You guys, you ladies are awesome. Yes, Just awesome. I mean, I'm really embracing you guys, each one of you. But something resonated in my head. I am, um, I was used to work at the Administration of Children's Service. Started from the bottom, then I became chief of staff. All is well. Have you guys ever thought about, and this every day at ACS, domestic violence on one hand is, is loud, is a, you know about it, but then it's a percentage of like 55 to 60% that is a silent killer that you hear nothing about. You have that on one hand, and you hear about that in the news when ACS goes into the house and find, discovers. Oh, da 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 da, -da. real stories. And then you have culture, the different cultures that have different ways of what, what may be to you, the brown and black uh, community, abuse may not be that way in someone from Nigeria. And I'm just calling out or the Jewish home. And I found out, finding out that the Jewish community have their own world their own world, like they have the schools, they do not have to, when we hear about abuse, because it's a silent killer, we don't have that opportunity like before, like we can go to uh, brown and black people and knock on their door. We have to go through the rabbi before we even talk to the family. And the rabbi, you can't just go to his home. You have to call a meeting and then before he comes in, he has to discuss it with the, his people because they want to handle things in their own way. And I'm t thinking, have you guys ever thought about that? Because right now I'm listening to you and it appears brown and black, the brown and black. And we all aware that this is not just brown and black. It is a silent killer and we're missing a lot of people. And again, the culture breakdown of each one. Have you guys ever set up a think tank around that? Because it's a real issue. Thank you. I don't know if my response is going to be so eloquent. Um, but no, you're right. Um, I have worked with women from the Jewish community. And there's, if they seek help, there's a threat that they'll never see their children again. Right. Um, I worked, I had a survivor that came in the other day who you're put in a really tough position, right? Because I'm telling her, well, in America, this is not okay. Although I understand culturally, this is your norm, right? So I think we have these discussions quite often, or at least I know I do, like there's a task force in Staten Island. We have these discussions talking about, um, like cultural humility, right? And um, even when we do our assessments, right? That they need to come from different cultural lenses. A lot of people, we have one assessment that we go with which is the Jackie Campbell assessment, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take into those cultural differences. So I, I don't, I'm tired of saying like conversation, conversation, conversation. Um, I think what's hard is a lot of people at the forefront of doing this work, the same way survivors have barriers, so do we, right? It's getting in the rooms of the people that really want to listen and are really about wanting to make those changes and having those hard conversations, right? 
why is it that black and brown children, right, are taken away from their families more often than other communities, right? But certain people don't want to hear that, you know? It's the truth, right? But certain people don't want to hear that. Why is it that the way that you are, I'll use your example, um, in the Jewish community, you go through the rabbi first. Why is that okay, but you go straight to the house of the other communities, right? So, and what you mentioned earlier about equity, there's no equity in that. There is no equity in that. And as a social worker, I hate that I'm a mandated reporter, right? I hate it because sometimes, sometimes it's needed, but when I'm calling, I don't know what's going to happen on the other side, you know? And I don't know if at times I might be doing more harm to that family, you know? So it's, it's a different, difficult position to be in um i know there needs to be change right and effective change and change that's equitable and you know we need to be in the rooms where the decisions are being made and really i love policy right but sometimes i think we we can um lose the face of the individuals that we're trying to help right right so i don't know if i answered the question but that's Kind of where I'm feeling. Again, I just want to bring it out. Sure. Brown and blacks get it all the time. Right? Yes. But it's really culturally it's Indian. everywhere. When you look at Indians, I don't know if you ever looked how they yeah. do their yeah. whole thing behind a roof, but it's really different. Right. Right. It ha I mean, it's a different world when you go to yeah. deal, dealing with different cultures. Right. Like we said before, like domestic violence does not discriminate, right? Exactly. It may look different depending on their culture, right? But it's there. It's there. Um, I think it's just how do we approach it right and how do we not do further harm if, if that makes sense you know? and, and still engage the because every community I, i've been a domestic violence and sexual assault um advocate for 13 years and i've worked in different organizations um and i can tell you it's to engage the because i think a lot of time a lot of mainstream organizations have this arrogance right we go into the communities we know best we're the expert we're here to help you we're here to save you um no we don't need your help because there are communities or, or, or there's grassroots organization like warm there's um a, an organization in new jersey called manavi that work with southeast asian populations did you reach out to them? There's Wi-Fi House in New Jersey that works with Arabic speaking um, populations, Muslim women. Have you reached out to them? Because they've been doing this work. So I think a lot of time mainstream organizations do not engage those um, grassroots organizations, those community level organizations that have been doing the work. And that's when sometimes we can cause more harm than good to these communities. And to your point, those mainstream organizations, we have to build relationships yeah. with those culturally based organizations that are within the community. Yeah. Um, and I really like what you said, we don't know what's best. And like, whenever you're working with a victim or survivor, like I said before, being client centered or trauma informed, we have to take that same approach when we're going into someone else's community, going into someone else's home. Um, give me, I have one more question that I want to ask the panel, and then I'm going to open it to continue the conversation, because a lot of time when we talk about violence, right, we always talk about it, it's already happening, it's happening, so how do we prevent it, what do we do to prevent it, to prevent violence in our, in our communities, how can we prevent domestic violence. That's not just the panel, it's for all of us to think about. I, I think one of the ways, one of the big ways to, to prevent domestic violence is education and awareness and resources, you know, and like you said, building those relationships, you know, we, we are a, the, we are a grassroots boots on the ground organization in Harlem, we're embedded in investing in our people, our people, you know, I know how much a gallon of milk costs in the bodega, because the bodegas, where we were left to shop we didn't know about whole no that whole food whole check okay because for some people in our community it's whole check you know but now we have these very excuse exclusive very expensive uh uh um uh, mega supermarkets and 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 these amazing big properties where we can't afford to live but to get back to that question i think education education and awareness and resources you know and unfortunately you know the money don't really go to our community it goes to the big conglomerates that's been out there for years that has the names but when it comes down to uh the issues and in our community they're not there 
you know, we, we are an organization. That's why I came back to Harlem. Because when I came back to Harlem 15 years ago, I didn't see anyone that looked like me. I didn't see anyone talking about domestic violence. I didn't see any, any representation of, of myself as a black and brown and Latino women. I didn't see that there, so we created it. So I think one of the most important things is education. And it's one of the ways that we can prevent uh, domestic violence and resources. I would also say, um, in addition to education, you've got to dismantle systems yeah. that are designed structurally to oppress those. I mean, if we want to talk about why we talk about black and brown people, you know, they're, 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 that's a whole other conversation to talk about historically, why are we overrepresented in systems um, like that, yeah. and I and I agree to Stephanie's point. We often are represented in these organizations at the staff level. Yes. Yeah, oh, we, we need to be at the leadership level. Yes, the middle Hello. management, senior Hello, executive leadership, and of course at the head of the organization. And that also has to be reflected on our boards, so that our perspectives, our experiences are incorporated into the conversations because many of these service organizations, if you look at their, the clients they serve, they're black and brown. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. majority. Um, and so it's really important that we continue to fight to dismantle these systems, to, to have allies mm -hmm. in men that when you are at a party or in a meeting or someone is speaking about a woman or a, a, a girl in a derogatory way that you as man are able to say, brother, that is unacceptable. And I'm gonna tell you why. This, these are the courageous conversations that we need to have with each other, mm -hmm. but men, and I would say this, that one of the biggest mistakes early on in the women's rights movement is that we didn't incorporate men mm -hmm. as part of our mm -hmm. allyship mm -hmm. to, to think about dismantling these mm -hmm. structures and also incorporating the voices, I would say, mm -hmm. of black and brown and Asian women. So I think there's a lot of power in this room, knowing who yeah. <laughs> many of yeah. you are and the work that you do and the circles that you move with. But sometimes you've got to get the suit off and just go in the neighborhood and yeah, talk to folks. Sneakers on. Go in the barbershop, which has been one of the most <laughs> successful models mm -hmm. for, for communicating and provide resources. There's so many resources that could be handed out. Thank you. I'm going to um, open up for questions. Um, I've seen your hand up for, for a while. I'll, I'll be right with you. I'm going to try my best with those heels. <laughs> um, so I wanted to piggyback off of what Stephanie said. I think um, it's very important education at a very young age, okay? In the classroom at a very young age, the Board of Education needs to pick up on that, okay? Um, as a member of 100 Black Men, we have this model, what they say they will be, okay? So it's important to start in the classroom. Another thing that's very important, we need to reach our hip hop entertainers and the, and the rappers that's constantly out there calling the B word, the N word, and, or, and educate them on that, okay? Because it's going crazy right now and it's been being accepted. And we're the, we, the parents and the adults that know better are, are responsible. We're not speaking up for this, okay? My son, all right, my, my father was a, was a woman beater, okay? So I realized that my whole family, after realizing my, my uncles and all nine of them were woman beaters, after I did my own research, and I said, you know what? It stops with me, okay? And w once it stopped with me, I made sure it stopped with my son. If my son was right here right now, he'll tell you, he'll never, ever put his hands on a woman because he learned that from me. So I, I'm stopping the cycle as it is right now. And that's what we need to do. Thank you. I would also say um, to that point, and we talked about this on our call yesterday, was, you know, when you're walking down the street now and you observe young, young folks, there's a lot of really concerning behavior that's happening. Progress. And one of the and things, one of the that, things I that I see, I see 
uh, with uh, young couples. Is this play fighting where y'all call, you're calling each other out of name? You're slapping everybody like it's a love tap. It's not a love tap because that behavior can be part of your love language. And when that's all you know how to do when things get really difficult or someone lacks impulse control, it can become extremely violent. The other thing is in conversation with not only our children, but other young people, what we see oftentimes is that you hear from young girls and we do all participate on these uh, panels is, well, he says he loves me and shows me he loves me. And, and I probe and I say, well, well, tell me what examples. Well, he's constantly texting me, wants to know where I am, what I'm doing, who, right? All of those things, who I'm with, what time I'm getting home, right? And uh, I, I'm gonna use, I'm, I'm probably oldest here on the panel. So I'm gonna use the phrase that we used to use in my day. I was like, that's not love, he's clocking you. Because if you would call him and do the same, guess what would happen? He would not answer. So these are the kinds of things that when we see it, you got to point out those examples. And I agree to the gentleman who just spoke to dismantling systems. Misogyny is at the root of all of this. So uh, it would be great to have uh, more allies from our community talking about these issues. Inside, and she's on the outside. We like this a long time ago. That, that's a no-no, and it's so acceptable right now. Just something like that needs to get eradicated. <laughs> 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 Mentorship. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Who's ready to be a mentor? <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank all of you ladies for being here, because this is important, number one. Number two. Ro just said allies, and I want to let you know as uh, the third vice president of one of the black men, we are all your allies, especially I want to give like nowadays they say you need to give just the flowers to the person while they're here. So I want to give special flowers to Stephanie. I've worked with Stephanie probably about five years or something, my other organization, and I was a community relations manager. So I was at a lot of events. I've been at events where it was a job fair. Stephanie was there. I was in Albany two weeks ago. Wasn't you in Albany two weeks ago? <laughs> and I just, and I wake up sometimes and I'm looking at the news and something happened in the community and who do I see on TV? Stephanie, you know what I'm saying? I'm like looking on Instagram, who is she with? The mayor, who is she with? The police department. And I think it's so innovative and so strengthening the work that you are doing because you are the face of this, like you're really taking this serious. We as one of black men, we take our work serious. We have members that we are here, we're doing God's work. And we are here to help individuals that need the help that we are able to give them. And for you to be out there five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, you don't have to be that. You don't have to do that. So I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate you, and I'm quite sure we, at speaking for my brothers at Wonder Black Men, we appreciate you as well. So if you ever need anything from us, if we're able to help, if we're able to help, no, 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 listen, even if, if you're able to help, just let us know. You know, I'm just letting us know that we're there. That's it. Echoing all the good things about this panel. So you've heard where 100 black men, what they see is what, what they'll be. But we believe that we've got to be a change. Mm -hmm. You've got to change some outcomes to save lives. And we don't just talk about it. Right? We really be about doing the work. So we are, um, well, first, for step, taking a step back, I went with the DA's office in Manhattan. DA in Manhattan, different kind of DA, right? Comes from a different kind of place. He's doing some different kind of things. One of those things is he has elevated domestic violence from a unit to an intimate partner bureau. Intimate partner violence bureau is now what we have in New York because we know domestic violence is so serious. 
And in being about the work, uh, Rudy just said, it stops with him. We are currently working on a project it's called the Jegna Project. The Jegna Project is a project that invites men to come back and serve and work in the community to help stop violent crime. So that's coming down the road. One of the elements of that is a DV project focused on men called No DV, It Starts With Me. And it's gonna start with these 100 black men. It's gonna start with these 100 black men because these are the men who can make the commitment. And the premise is that we know that men, like Rudy just said, yeah, it can't be me. I would never do it. it stops with me. And men are all thinking that. We learn when we're five years old, you don't hit a girl. We learn that somewhere along the line, something flips. We don't know where it flipped. Is it the media that makes it flip? And it happens to grown men, young men, something happens. We need to have the tools and those tools have to come from the people doing the work, boots on the ground, at our DA's office, people working in our organizations have to educate us like you did today, but also give us tools so we can have that conversation. When we see a brother and he's going down the wrong road, we need to be able to pull his coat and say, brother, I see you going this way. Here's some information that I can help you with. So we can have those what you call courageous conversations because we won't always do that. And men won't always go to anybody to talk, right? If it has anything to do with any kind of health, we're not going to anybody. And DV is a mental health issue, right? It's a power issue, it's a mental health issue. We're not going to anybody. But brothers, we've got to recognize it in each other and hold each other accountable. You've got to know what the warning signs are. So we're starting a project that's going to be a no DV project focused on men, not men who are battered, not men who uh, we know they might do, have some symptoms. It's for all men, especially those who have a voice and influence like, like uh, our Reverend DeGraff right here, or Fred Davis, Aldrin Ennis, Rudy Coombs, brothers who can go out and get the ear of other brothers and say, oh, whether younger, older, you're going down the wrong road. And give us the tools through training, because this will be a training module first before you go out and do this work. Give us the tools so that we can recognize it in ourselves, right? Everybody doesn't know that if you saw a, a battering in your home, there's a possibility that it lives somewhere inside you. Somebody's got to tell you that. You can say, you know what? That's somewhere inside me. So when I know I'm on the road and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm recently married, my cake is still frozen. So I, I want to know, hey, you know what? This is a different pressure. I'm seeing something else. I want to be able to call Rudy Coombs and say, Rudy, I'm seeing something else. And he can tell me what that is. So I never get anywhere near it. So there is help along coming along the way in real tangible steps, not just conversation, because we could all leave here and do nothing. And the 100 black men are the informed black men. But if we don't go out and inform 100 more and encourage them to do the same, the problem will stay the same. And, and sisters, you'll be doing the work by yourselves. So we're committed to helping. The DA's got a program coming up in Harlem physically to help. We'll be reaching out to get information from our, our, our women who have that information. And brothers, of course, will be reaching out to you to help. Thank you. And so my question, I do have a question. <laughs> I, I hate, I, I hate I'm, when I'm the moderator, I hate when people just talk like I just talk. But I do have a question. What do we need in order to make this work? Money. <laughs> we, we, may have, we, we can find the resources, but there's information, other things we need. What do we need? Not, not just money. What do we really need? What would that money buy? We need money, uh, political will. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Right. Yeah. There, well, we, we have They're really reformed. evolved. Yeah. We've really evolved in terms of the law, um, but there's so many factors. Again, you know, uh, uh, doing what we need to do at all levels of our lives to eliminate misogyny. Well, m well, men, one, are doing this in partnership with women, right? So it's not just men taking the lead or women taking the lead, we are coming together to do this work. And I would just say one of the most important things to understand about domestic violence, some may say it's mental health, 
it's also learned behavior. Yes. And and it is it is modeled behavior. It is a uh, embedded in culture. It is in re embedded in some religious um, beliefs. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go into that. It's been embedded in law where terms like rule of thumb that you should never use. Mm -hmm. It's embedded in phrases that we say, well, boys will be boys. So these are the things that need to be addressed as a community, as a village, in order to ensure that we are standing up for the values of not only women, LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. immigrants, and, and for men as well, to ensure that we are embracing a model of equality. And so I would say for men, it's, listen, be willing to hear the information. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you have these conversations, you hear from men, well, you know, uh, a lot of women just do this so that, you know, they can get into public housing or they can get, you know, resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, we all know this. I, probably you're looking at, I don't know, 40 years of experience at, yeah. at this table. Um, uh, I've never experienced that as a practitioner uh, and working in this space. And we need to break down those myths and let people know that is simply not true. Mm -hmm. um, and to put in the work and listening, I think is really extremely important. Using your voice, get on a bus and go to Albany. Yeah. Uh, March in the Brides March. Yeah. Uh, beyond yeah, Women's year. History Month, uh, we don't just have a month. Every day is Women's <laughs> History Amen. Day. So, yeah. And not history, but her uh -huh. story. Right. Um, her so, story. Um, right. you know, there, there's a lot of things that go well beyond just mm -hmm. this conversation today. I think, too, sometimes power can be seen as a negative thing. But if you do have the power, use that power to get into the room so the people that mm -hmm. can really affect change and um, I think it's also important that we remove the stigma, right? We can't not talk about it. We have to remove the stigma. Right. We have to stop victim blaming. Um, and we have to contend victim survivor blaming, sorry. Um, and we just have to continue these courageous conversations. And, you know, when we were talking about oppression earlier and how some of these um, systems are very oppressive, why is that, right? Like, who. Right. So who made those laws? Right. Who even if we're talking about mental health, if we think about those that um, came up with these different diagnoses, like who were they? Right. Who did they look like? They didn't look like us. Right. So if we are in positions of power, we have to use our power. We have to use our influence. And that's how we continue to make the changes that we need by knowing what our communities need. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Right. So yeah, this is going you. to also, you know, we need our men. This is the beginning, and we're grateful that you know, hundred black men a year. But like I said, when we majority of the time when we're out there, we're we're out there by ourselves. So we need you to be more involved. But accountability, 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 because there's you know one of the reasons why that vicious cycle just continues to perpetuate is there's no accountability. You know, we need men to take accountability, and we need men to mentor these young boys these young boys are hurting and they're coming out of violent homes and when they don't see uh you know someone that they can look up to or, or maybe inspire to uh maybe become an entrepreneur or go back to school so we need more mentorship but we need our men involved in everything that we do no <laughs> no, it was one more back there. He had his hand up for a long time. Okay. Um, so I think we're wrapping up, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Before we wrap up, there's a book that I'm obsessed with. I read it every quarter. In my, like every quarter, I, I pick this book up. It's called All About Love by Bell Hooks. And I love this book. I would recommend it to anybody. Um, and one of the quotes that, because um, I'm reading it again, I don't know why I always pick it up. This book is tall, um, it's actually in my purse. It's really bad. <laughs> I write all over it. Um, this quote popped up to me and I wanted to, I'm like, oh, this is really fitting for the conversations that we're having today. Um, 
It says that abuse and neglect negate love and care and affection. The opposite of abuse and humiliations are the foundation of love. Also, no one can rightfully claim to be loving when behaving abusively. So I think uh, the time when we think about love, you know, we have to ask a question, you know, do we love, love the, do, do we love each other? Do we love ourselves? And, uh, and love comes from God. And when we are loving in a godly way, we ne we're never going to want to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of leave you with that. And thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. Give it up to them again. <laughs> Thank you for the two hundred black people having us here to having this wonderful conversation, and thank you for inviting me here. And um, I'm going to pass the torch over to you. No more words. Okay. Can, can we get another round of applause? <laughs> it's it's never um, an easy conversation when dealing with um, a, a topic that some of us have experienced, right? Um, I was um, on, the, on a Zoom with the, with the women last night and they were talking about, hey, you know, you walk into a room of accomplished women and someone in there has gone through this, right? So similar here, I'm sure that someone either has seen it um, in their immediate family, have grown up with it, um, but so thank you all very much for sharing your expertise with us. And normally what we would do for um, Women's History Month is present you all with a token of appreciation. Um, so that will happen right now. Um, our third vice president, he spoke about giving flowers um, while you can still um, receive them. So first off, those are your flowers to start. <laughs> But we also have awards for you. And they are Esther Awards. So biblically speaking, Esther was a strong woman who um, used her prowess, if you will, to um, help her community. So the four of you have really exemplified that with the work that you've done as far as your careers are concerned and saving so many lives. So you'll notice that we have four awards, but um, Jamel is holding an award himself. So the fifth one goes to a woman who I've known in my 20s, um, and she has done an amazing um, amount of work, not only with 100 Black Men, with a whole bunch of Black organizations throughout New York City. And her name is Margot Jordan. Oh, wow. <laughs> so so that, that's, the, that's the woman with the camera. So, so for those of you who have been around, um, have attended so many different events, um, you've seen a woman behind the camera um, chronicalizing it, capturing it, doing her small part um, to make sure that our story is told um, in our voice. So to Margo, you, you too get flowers. And that concludes this part <laughs> of the program. And I'd like to bring up. Did he get good pictures? Because I know Margo. Did he do that right? Um, sure.
So again, congratulations, ladies, on an outstanding presentation. And before we leave, ladies and gentlemen, a couple of things I just want to share out. Again, let's give them another warm round of applause. We started this conversation talking about some of the activities that 100 Black Men is doing. I'd like to close out by sharing just a few more things to kind of put on your calendar. Um, our largest fundraiser of the year is our gala, and many of you were at our gala. I'm happy to announce that um, we are already in the process of putting together, putting together our gala for 2024. Mr. Uh, Don Peebles has agreed to be one of our honorees. We believe that Loretta Lewis will also be one of our honorees. So please be, look, be on the lookout for Save the Date as we kind of pull those things together a year in advance. But more closely, and our second uh, most important fundraiser actually is our golf outing. And this year, um, we have four days of golf. The first will be July 31st. Um, and on that day is our community day. Our community honoree will be Lesset. So we would invite you all to come out and support Lesset and support the 100 Black Men on July 31st. On August 1st, we have our community, we have our member day. Our member honoree this year is Derek Barnes. Again, we would ask that you come out and support Derek and 100 Black Men on August 1st. And then something that we do, we, we talk a lot about how involved we are with young people. But well, we have a multi-year relationship with the PGA of America. And last year we had the inaugural Junior 100 Challenge where we brought our young people to golf. Many of them had never played golf before. And now we find that we've got some of our young people playing golf down in South Carolina and Myrtle Beach. They have learned the game. They are, they are continuing to play the game. And so this year we will continue that, that uh, legacy by having our Junior 100 Challenge on August 7th, that's a Monday, where we will have a number of young people that are part of our Junior 100 program, again, talk about the business of golf, the opportunities that are in the field of golf, also you know, hoping to extend the soft skills that our young people learn while being on a, on a golf course. And finally, on August 8th, we will have what's called our CEO challenge. And that means that we are going after corporate entities to bring in a C-suite team of ideally one male, one female, one of our members, or one of the PGA members, and one of our Junior 100 uh, golfers to play. The price tag is extraordinary, but all, that, all those resources go to support the young people that we support and the programming that we support. It sounds like we're gonna be doing something around domestic violence. So again, support the programs that the 100 Black Men puts together because the resources that we, that we garner from these activities go to support the young people that we, that we uh, support year over year. Again, education, economic empowerment, and health and wellness are the areas that we focus. And having said that, again, please join us for our activities. Thank you for being here tonight. I believe there's still some refreshments upstairs. Thanks for joining Hunter Black Good night.